Hannah is like the bluing master The bluing master <laughs> <laughs> I work in progress. Constantly learning, as you know, with um, any historical research. You think you have it all figured out, and then, you know, you read some other publication, and you're like, oh, whoops, looks like I had it all wrong. <laughs> um, so, mainly what I wanted to kind of do is uh, talk through the different types of bluings that we have. Um, I have three up in the shop. And there are actually five main bluings that they used historically. So we're just going to take some time and kind of talk through these of where they all fit into the timeline and which ones are good and which ones are bad and all that kind of stuff. So, um... I feel like a giant! I feel like maybe I'm going to just stand a little bit. Now we're, like, now we're like maybe the same height. Okay, so I made this... Oh, we can see if we can do it without the glare. Okay, I made this super cool um, display with all of the different bluings. So there's a sample of the actual pigment in each, and then there's a sample of the actual... Uh, <laughs> Hi, Patrick. <laughs> your shipping is out, you guys. So if you ordered, your shipping is out. Um, and then I did like a little fabric swatch of each also. So if we start kind of in the beginning, there were two main pigments. And um, it kind of depends on who you ask which one came first. But those would be smalt and indigo. Okay, so what is bluing for? Before we get into that. That's true. What is bluing for? Okay. <laughs> Putting the car before the horse a little bit here. Um, bluing is used in laundry to make your whites whiter. So you're going to have a little bit of color theory in there. Um, right. So if you apply like a tiny amount of blue pigment to something, it's going to kind of brighten up dingy you come in yellow clothing. So you're really talking. Okay, so, so bluing is to make your whites whiter. Yes. Okay, and there's yep. like... A science to it but basically it like gives this cool cast and like don't keep it in there very long but it's pretty awesome it's great for like um aprons caps like uh shifts like anything shirts that's, like you want coats anything white. white yeah so let's go with the heart the horse let's go with the horse the horse the cart what are we doing now <laughs> we're gonna put the horse in front of the cart now. okay awesome <laughs> okay so i'm gonna start with smalt because i have that one on the end and here let me just put up just a bit yeah, so it's right here. Oh, except you can't really see it. It's gl it You can kind of see it. Yeah. There's like a I can glare in this take it out of the thingy yeah. too. Okay. Smalt, and we might get a little bit sciencey here. I'm not a science person, but I'm becoming a science person because of all of this <laughs> bluing stuff. Okay, so smalt gets its pigment from cobalt. Um, and if you're looking for like the chemical name for it or whatever, it's potassium cobalt silicate. Okay. And that basically means that it's powdered glass. So they take glass um, and while it's still hot, they cast it into cold water so it breaks. And then from there it goes and it gets ground into a really, really, really fine powder. So when we're using it for laundry stuff, it's usually mixed with a starch or something, which I'm sure helps the process a little bit. It totally sucks to work with. Um, and some of this, like, you can't really see the fabric swatch at all. I don't know if I can get it a little bit better. There we go. Jimmy, okay. hold it while you point at it. No, I think I'm good. Okay. So, um, it's really difficult to work with. And as you can see, even though I'm obviously over dyeing all of these swatches, this is not how much you use if you're bluing laundry. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Just a teeny, teeny little bit. I used a lot of the small pigment, and that's as dark as I could get it. Mm. So, um... And it settles out so fast. Um, most of the laundry instructions will tell you uh, stuff about watching out that things don't get speckles on them and having the bluing settle on the actual uh, garments. And this is a real problem for pretty much everybody because most of these, um, until we get to the end, way over here, none of them are water soluble. So, uh, having speckles on your clothing, I think, was probably a fairly normal occurrence. And as you practice bluing, it gets to be less and less and less. Um, but in the beginning, expect to have speckles on your glued items. That's why I start with underpinnings, because nobody <laughs> can see it. Yeah. Yeah, so start with, like, your under petticoats and work your way out. Um... So, uh, smalt was used kind of from like the, even in the 1600s, all the way up 
uh, to like the Civil War, because um, around the Civil War, the American Civil War, that is, um, we started, a lot of these other ones started kind of coming to the forefront as well. It depended a lot on uh, availability. Um, but yeah, small, super difficult to work with. I do not carry this one in the shop at all because the cobalt is kind of toxic. So even though we're probably not working with enough to make us sick, I was like, this is really hard to work with and moderately toxic and I just don't want to go there. So it's a really cool thing. I experimented it with a little bit just so I can kind of show how it works and what the color kind of looks like. But yeah, it's cool history and really difficult. Yeah, we want to keep you guys safe. Like, yes. That's number yes. one. Um, but we want to do it historical at the same time. So sometimes there's things we have to throw out. But there's other options. You just have to dig. Dig, dig, yep. dig. Yeah, for sure. So indigo is also on the playing field at that time. And they're also using it for bluing. And as you can see, it has a totally different color. It's so dark. Like, think blue jeans. Like, those dark Levi blue jeans. They're dyeing that with indigo, but that indigo has to go through a chemical process before it becomes water-soluble. And... Oh, oh, I have a fascinating fact about blue jeans that Patrick just told me just the other day. Oh, boy. He <laughs> says... Patrick says that he just learned through his, like cool like how to be a gentleman youtube videos that he oh, watches <laughs> are they working that, i don't know <laughs> that you should never ever ever wash your blue jeans huh now i haven't looked into this personally but like that's what his youtube videos are saying so now he's like we've been doing it all wrong we're washing our blue jeans so i just thought i'd throw that out there well as <laughs> as i've worked with okay so bluing is something that with your whites you're gonna do it like every single time you wash. So I don't think blue is a real stable dye to begin with. And even today, if we're not supposed to wash with blue jeans, <laughs> um, we do know that when we buy new blue jeans, they're nice and dark. And, you know, when you've had them for a couple of years and you've washed them a couple of times, uh, they're not really as blue as they were when they were new. Um, anyways, back to bluing. Um, the, the indigo has a totally different kind of cast to it, but it's still going to have the same effect and it's not water soluble either. Um, and uh, let's see, I have an 1880s recipe that does go through the chemical process and does make it water soluble, but that involves some fairly harsh chemicals that I am not necessarily sure I want in my kitchen. So we're just rolling with this version, okay? And this we do have in the shop. Um, comes in a cute little package that looks like this. Um, and what's inside here is uh, indigo in its original form is kind of like a, a block. And let's see, if I tip the board sideways, you can see there's a big chunk sticking up. So um, it comes as kind of like this block and you can either kind of shave it off or what I did for the packaging there is I wrapped it in a piece of cotton so that you can get the cotton wet and just squeeze out the pigment you want, which is a really awesome method to do it because you're not going to end up with as large of pieces of sediment uh, and particles in your bluing water. And that lessens your chance of having like speckles on your stuff. Right. So <clears throat> always a good thing. Because in the 18th century, things weren't combined for you. Right. I mean, so far yeah. you haven't so, done that. Yeah. So if you were in the if you were buying uh, this in the 18th century, you would just be going down and buying a big block of indigo, and you would do uh, wrapping it in uh, what are they? There's all kinds of options of what you could wrap it in, depending on what manual and what person you were following. So it could be anything from flannel to just plain cotton, linen, muslin, whatever. Um, I went cotton because it's just as effective, and I feel like it's easier to get wet. Like, if you wrap it in flannel, like, you're fighting to get that wool to, right. to get enough moisture in it to squeeze the pigment out. So, um, the indigo we have works pretty well. Um, so, let's see. Then we're moving on to Prussian blue. This is, like, the very first uh, synthetic blue dye. And I want to say it was the first synthetic, like, ever. But don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> but, it, okay, so it came out in in the early 1700s. I think it became kind of commercially available to people in um, uh, 1724. It was used a lot by artists. And this has, like, a much, much darker, kind of richer color. 
This is not water soluble either, and it gets because many of them weren't. Because many of them throughout weren't. history, many of them weren't. It wasn't until later that <laughs> they're like, "Hey, let's make it easier for you guys. Maybe you'll buy more of it." Yeah. I well, mean, not that it stopped them. I mean, everybody. Well, everybody it had to have it. So, yes. like, yeah, like it yeah. was it was a necessity in the household historically. Whether you're like, and people may want to argue this, like in the 18th century, you know, if you if you wanted your like white white i mean that's how you would do it mm -hmm. so. so it's like their version of bleach for us right yeah bleach, bleach became kind of a replacement but yeah. i think like in modern times we do have bluings uh kind of mixed in already with our modern detergents and hmm. i think so a lot of them I, are blue I, a lot of yeah, them are blue i yeah. often wonder like why <laughs> Even bleach has a little bit why of they're blue too. you know yeah. when you pour yeah. them out of the bottle they're already blue so i'm thinking that the the bluing agents are already kind of built in um and i mean you see it on the commercials too that like oh our detergent are your t-shirts looking Keeps dingy white. That's yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly so um the best way to do that is bluing agents uh prussian blue has a iron base so it gets its pigment color from iron uh which is really cool but also a little bit uh difficult to work with too because if this comes in contact with your soap, it's gonna turn into the not as pretty looking iron, like rust. rust. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so um, we're kind of looking into some of like the the rust spots on original garments, and if those come from Prussian bling, perhaps it's probably one of my most referenced ones in my later uh, my later publications. That this I'm may be at. like a really good time to say if you guys collect like random pieces of clothing like historical clothing and you see these little brown spots and it's just like a small piece that you don't care if you have in your collection or not like you could throw it out get in touch with us and send it to us <laughs> yes <laughs> because yeah. we because uh we can do some really cool stuff with it and i don't think you really want to get into like all that right now or do you no cool? that's complicated and i'm still okay. learning and i'm working okay. with some chemists to yes. figure out some of but uh, the finer details of this but what we need is we need like small pieces <laughs> that can go under microscopes and stuff and like all of my pieces that i <laughs> remember that that day like that night we spent like almost like the whole day and night like going through my stuff but my pieces are just too big i don't have any small little deteriorated chunks that can I'd go under the microscope yeah definitely so if you guys can like mm -hmm. if you have it and you just want to get rid of it mm -hmm. like let us know and and that would be awesome because research is good mm -hmm. yes yeah, research <laughs> is good research is awesome um, yeah, so Prussian blue, this one kind of starts showing up in, uh, well, artists are using it quite a bit. It doesn't really show up in the laundry world until kind of like the 1870s and 1880s. Ooh, Sarah has a really good comment here. So Sarah says, most modern detergents like Tide have bluing agents, but they are called optical whiteners. Hmm. So I wonder if that's just like a new term. You know how like yeah, things yeah. change terminology? That could, that time? could be. I mean, most of these have a million names for them too i've been really struggling with some of the names like you go through <clears throat> through everything and i can touch on that when i'm kind of done going through them individually here and but... beth says uh make sure not to eat your tide pods <laughs> <laughs> thanks beth yes uh let's yeah. not yeah let's don't not eat don't pods. eat your bluing either don't, eat your bluing. <laughs> don't <laughs> eat your bluing none of it's really good for you to ingest especially probably the smalt oh my gosh um okay